What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. I can be found on Twitter at Kyle YNFL. I am joined today by Pat Fitzmorris, one of my great friends in the industry. The man who I split writing the primer with last season in honor of our good friend Mike Taglier. Pat, how are you? It has been a long time. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, Yates. Uh, great to catch up. Miss working with you, but you know it's good that we've stayed friends and and can still talk on uh, podcasts. Absolutely. I as I looked ahead at the schedule and looking at this mock draft, I was like, I gotta get Pat on the I gotta get Pat on the podcast. Gotta pick his brain here on some of these rookies, and we are going to do just that here today. Going through four rounds of a one quarterback format rookie mock draft this is going to be a ton of fun before we get into that i do want to point out something here a way that you can help support the show that is by rating and reviewing the podcast over on apple podcasts on spotify wherever you're listening here rating and reviewing helps way more than you could possibly imagine so take 30 seconds out of your day go over leave a quick review there five star rating anything that you like about the show things that we i can improve on here to make it more enjoyable for you make sure that you drop that there rate and review the podcast 30 seconds out of your day helps out in a major major way all right pat let's get into here i just want to get right to it because there we've talked a lot about these rookies here already this week i want to get your thoughts so if you are listening to this uh podcast though over on you know wherever you listen to your podcast you can watch the mock draft play out you can see the draft board as it unfolds here over on the youtube channel youtube.com slash the fantasy playbook while you're there hit the like button and subscribe as well so pat let's get right to this you are the guest you get the 101 selection here again a one quarterback format who are we going here are we going to running back at the top we are. We're going to go with Brees Hall from Iowa State. And, uh, you know, he's been my one-on-one pretty much throughout the process. I know, like, Derek Brown, my colleague at Fantasy Pros Now, makes a, a good case for Kenneth Walker being ahead of uh, Bryce Hall. But I'm not quite buying it myself. I'm going with Hall. Um, you know, didn't totally love the landing spot, but it could have been worse. So, um, yeah, man, Hall's, Hall's pretty much a do-it-all guy. Very content with him at one-on-one. What are your expectations and projections for how you see this backfield playing out this next season? Because I think with Michael Carter, we're not going to see him completely go away, right? Yeah, that's kind of it. I think he's going to be the passing down back and we're going to see Hall in there, but you know, they can still throw to the backs on early down. So maybe something in the 30 to 39 catch range for Hall. Um, but you know, uh, an ample amount of carries, probably something like 200 to 250. So I think we see a, a net like over a thousand yards combined and, um, you know, it's a, an improving offense. So maybe there's some yep. touchdown upside there too. I don't know if we're going to get 10 out of him, but hopefully something close to like eight. Absolutely. All right. Here at the 102, we got Brees Hall off the board at the 101. That is my number one overall player on my dynasty big board. I'm going to go here with my number two overall player. That is the wide receiver for the Tennessee Titans, Traylon Burks. I'm going to go Burks here. He was my wide receiver one throughout the entire pre-draft process. I love the landing spot. We have an easy projection for him here, stepping into the Tennessee Titans offense, right? With no AJ Brown, who I comped to, you know, Traylon Bur or I comped Burks to AJ Brown, stepping right into that role in this offense. We know that the opportunity is there. When you look at this wide receiver core, where else is the ball going to go? Robert Woods rehabbing from that injury. We don't know how he's going to come back off of it. So Traylon Burks could easily walk into a massive opportunity this next season and produce. And they're simply just going to get the ball in his hands. And that's what he's best at being able to create after the catch. So I'm going to go Traylon Burks here. You're going to see all sorts of different variations and uh, you know, different wide receivers going as the wide receiver one off the board in different places too. I'm going to go Traylon Burks here. I'm going to stick to my board at the one Oh two. You are now up at the one Oh three. Yeah. I like that call too. Um, I'm going to go with Drake London at one Oh three. And I, after Going in, I did have him at uh, as my wide receiver one, but not a lot of separation, I would say, between the top three or three to five guys, really. And, um, you know, the landing spot, I think, was particularly favorable for both London and Burks, where they have a chance to just be clear alpha guys right away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and number three, Drake London, pretty easy call there. Yep, London is my wide receiver too after the NFL draft, so I like the spot here. And we're starting to get now, as we move throughout the week, we're starting to get a sense of ADP, right? You look at Dynasty League Football, they're putting out these, these ADP rankings and everything like that. You can kind of see how actual drafts are playing out. And Drake London going off the board at the 102. So he is typically going off the board as the one oh or the first wide receiver off the board. You're getting him here at the 103 as the wide receiver too. 
it's very, very close between Trail and Burks, Drake London in my rankings there. I'll go Burks at one and then Drake London at two. All right, I'm up at the 104 here. I'm going to go back to the running back position. I'm going to go with my number three overall player here. I'm going to go Kenneth Walker. And, you know, I'm not in love with the landing spot because of the state of the offense, right? In Seattle, we just don't know how many plays this offense is going to run next year, how many scoring opportunities. I wouldn't be shocked with Drew Locke as a starting quarterback if they are among the, you know, the worst in the league as far as total points scored. But with Walker, this is more of a projection for not just this year, but moving forward. What does Seattle do after that? And Kenneth Walker could completely have this backfield to himself in 2023 and beyond. Kenneth Walker was my RB1 throughout the pre-draft process after the NFL Combine. Absolutely loved what he brought to the table. And I think that he is going to make an impact this year. And we know that Rashad Penny isn't exactly the model of health either. So we could see Penny get injured and Kenneth Walker instantly has this backfield to himself as early as 2022. I just think that the ceiling is limited based on the overall off the state of the offense here as we move into 2022 with Drew Locke as the starting quarterback. So I'll go Kenneth Walker off the board here at the 104. You're now up at the 105. All right, so I'm going to take Garrett Wilson here, Yates, and I feel like he has the safest floor of any of the top five guys. And, um, you know, not that I am worried about any of the top five, but I feel like there are these nagging little questions with each of them, like Drake London, you know, we've seen Pac-10 contested, Pac-12, excuse me, contested catch guys not work out, like Nikhil Harry and J.J. Sure. Fago whiteside Like, obviously, he's a better prospect than those guys, but... Um, you know, Jamison Williams, is he going to be injury prone with that slight frame? Uh, Traylon Burks, a lot of manufactured touches, wasn't quite as big or as fast as they hoped he was going to be when he was at the combine. And uh, Chris Olave, you know, not really a lot of yak uh, throughout his college career. So minor concerns with all those guys. But I think Garrett Wilson is like the one guy who's pretty foolproof here. And, uh, you know, I do think there's star upside. Didn't love seeing him land alongside Elijah Moore. I think that kind of, you know, lowers the ceiling for both guys. But overall, still feeling pretty good about him as a number five pick. Yeah, with Garrett Wilson, as we look at the projection for the next level, it's easy, right? You say there's he's a really, really well-rounded prospect. There are very few flaws to his game. If he had landed in a spot like Atlanta, where we knew the target share was going to be there, then I think that we would be talking about him as the wide receiver one off the board. You know, he was wide receiver two for me, uh, wide receiver one for a lot of people uh, going into the NFL draft. With this landing spot, I think that for Garrett Wilson to reach his ceiling, it's going to completely depend upon Zach Wilson. What type of quarterback does Zach Wilson grow into? Because if he can continue to ascend and he can continue to grow into potentially a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, having Wilson at the, as the wide receiver one and Elijah Moore as that, you know, one B or wide receiver two in the offense, both of these guys can be very, very productive for fantasy. If Zach Wilson cannot take that step forward. You at least still have a safe floor to fall back on with Garrett Wilson makes him a safe selection as a top five wide receiver or a top five player off the board here. See, he sits at what? Uh, five overall in my dynasty big board as well. All right, here at the 106, I'm going to go with another Ohio State, former Ohio State wide receiver. I'm going to go with Chris Olave. I want to hear your thoughts on this landing spot, Pat, because I'm in love with it. We look at Olave landing with the New Orleans Saints, and I think that the passing volume is absolutely going to be there. As we look at the opportunity for Olave in this offense, it's Michael Thomas, who is he coming back? Like we, we really don't know yet. We don't have confirmation on one. If Thomas is going to be ready to go for training camp for the regular season, we have no idea where he's at in that recovery from the injury. We don't know his, you know, affinity for the team. There was a lot of, you know, rumors and stuff like that about, you know, there, there being a divide with the, the franchise here in new Orleans. So we just don't know exactly what's going to happen here with Michael Thomas. And even if he does come back, if he is on the field, He's not exactly the most durable, and he's an older wide receiver anyway. So Olave has the opportunity to soak up targets this next season. And if they allow Jameis Winston to open up the offense just a little bit, I think that we could be looking at Olave as a target machine here in New Orleans. So I, I love the landing spot for Olave. I think that you're kind of seeing his, his value all over the board in, in rookie drafts. So it's not a guarantee that he's going to be here at the 106. There's a potential that he's there for you at the 110, depending on your rookie draft. I'm very comfortable spending a top six pick on Chris Olave landing in New Orleans. I want to hear your thoughts on Olave before we move on to your next selection. I'm with you. Um, I also would have taken him in that slot. And I, I think of, we've seen a lot of people jump Jamison Williams ahead of him. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, I'm with you in liking the fit. 
Uh, even if Michael Thomas is there, he's basically a different type of receiver. He runs a different route tree. Uh, mm-hmm. He's going to be that short area intermediate guy, and Olave can take the top off a of defense. But he's versatile. I mean, we've seen the craftsmanship in his route running. Like, this guy can run an out and, like, break ankles and have some guy, mm-hmm. you know, falling backwards when he runs that out. So, um, great route runner, best in the class, sub 4-4 speed. And he's got a quarterback who is not afraid to throw the ball deep downfield and let his guys make plays. So, yeah, I like the landing spot, too. All right. So we have the first six picks. Brees Hall, Traylon Burke, Drake London, Kenneth Walker, Garrett Wilson, and Chris Olave off the board. You are now on the clock at the 107. Okay, so I do have to take Jamison Williams here, but um, I am in the minority, I think, now in liking Olave more than Williams. And um, I I think my issue here, I'm a little worried that he's going to be another Deshaun Jackson, like not Mm. a volume guy, a big play guy, but, you know, maybe a big play guy who deals with injuries because of that slight frame. And we're already going to lose probably at least the first three or four games with him, uh, maybe the first six if he goes on pup for the ACL late in the season. So um, I'm a little worried about him, but obviously like the the home run potential is there, the big play potential. Uh, Maybe we don't see a ton of it right away just because shaky quarterback, a lot of target competition in Detroit, but you know, they aggressively went up for this guy. And I do think he's going to be a a pretty exciting guy. Like at worst, he's Will Fuller at the very worst. And, you know, at at his best, maybe he's like Deshaun Plus, who stays healthy and, you know, gets a little more volume than Deshaun used to. Yeah, it's a, an interesting fit here in Detroit as we look at what they want to do on offense. Because if they, looking at like Jalen Waddle from last year, which I think Jamison Williams could fit fill a very similar role for an offense, well, you got Amon Ross St. Brown occupying that role underneath. Now, Amon Ross St. Brown is not going to do the same things after the catch that Jalen Waddle does. But with Williams here in Detroit, where, what's the plan for him? What is the role that he's going to occupy? Is he that Z receiver who really is going to fill that Will Fuller, Deshaun Jackson field stretcher role? Because if so, you got Jared Goff as your quarterback for, you know, and Detroit loves Jared Goff for some reason. So I, what is the long-term projection there for Williams in Detroit when you don't, when you have a quarterback who's not really willing to push the ball deep downfield? Is Williams going to be incredibly boomer bust? That's something where I'm taking into account and just being like, or are they going to try to, use him underneath and let him create after the catch. There's a little bit of uncertainty there with Williams and his fit in Detroit. I know that they love him. They sent away, you know, draft capital to go to go get him. And he's an incredibly talented player. I just have questions about the fit and what role he's going to occupy in that offense that could drastically alter how we view him and what his fantasy outlook is moving forward. It is neck and neck for this wide receiver here is my wide receiver five and Jamison Williams of wide receiver six Sky Moore, the wide receiver out of Western Michigan to the Kansas city chiefs. I was baffled, did not know what, why, why in the world did Sky Moore fall to number 54 overall? As we saw guys like Tyquan Thornton go off the board above him, it was just absolutely ridiculous to see, to see Sky Moore continue to tick down and, and fall. But as we started to get closer, it was like, okay, he's going to land with Kansas city. There's the potential that he lands with Kansas city. And instantly in that situation, we have the talent matched with the dynamic offense. You got MVS, who has an absolute roller coaster of a career so far. We just I really do not know what to expect from him this next year or moving forward in Kansas City. Juju Smith-Schuster in town on a short-term deal. Sky Moore has the positional versatility to play inside-outside. So he could be a guy who takes over some of these slot snaps for Juju Smith-Schuster, or he could be that outside receiver alongside MVS and stay on the field. I think there's a very good chance that Moore establish, establishes himself as the wide receiver one for this offense sooner than later. And when you have some uncertainty about the weapons for Patrick Mahomes moving forward with Kelsey getting up there in age, MVS, how is he going to translate to this offense? Juju Smith-Schuster might not be back next year. Sky Moore is the one consistent option moving forward. So love the talent coming out. He lands in a great situation. He is absolutely in consideration for me to go off the board as a top five wide receiver. I'm going to take Sky Moore here at the 108. You are now up at the 109. Yeah, love that pick. And what a day two the Chiefs had with Sky Moore falling to them in the second. And then my guy, Wisconsin linebacker, Leo Chanel, falling to them in the third. And uh, Yates, it was actually you who kind of uh, turned me on to the Sky Moore film in January. Tweeted something about, like, Sky Moore is such a fun watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was familiar with the name, but not really with the game. And I went and uh, saw some of the highlights. And yeah, you know, just... He's a guy you fall in love with when you watch some of the stuff he did at, at Western Michigan. So, um... 
I'm going to go with Jahan Dotson here, and I felt sort of vindicated uh, that he went so high in the first round, like midway through the first, um, because this was a guy I really liked at Penn State, just obviously great speed, really good hands. I've heard him compared to a uh, Deontay Johnson with better hands. Mm -hmm. And man, this guy, like, he has contested catch skills that you would normally see from a much bigger receiver. He is like a a Tyreek Hill in that he does shockingly well on balls in the air for kind of a little right. receiver. But um, so I really like this guy a lot. Uh, I, maybe the landing spot isn't ideal with Terry McLaurin still there as of now, but um, I'm totally sold on the player. So Jahan Dotson. Jahan Dotson going off the board there at the 109. It's going to be interesting to see what role he fills. Again, we talked about the rules that players are going to occupy in the offenses. That's crucial for fantasy outlook, fantasy projection, right? We have to understand what roles they're going to occupy, and that will lead to their projection for the next level. So with Dotson, is he going to slide into the slot role in this offense? Because I think that that's his best fit as his at his size. Now, I think he has the ability to play outside, but you got Terry McLaurin there. Uh, you know, Curtis Samuel, where does he line up? You got De'Ami Brown, is De'Ami Brown a thing, right? I think Dotson, if he ends up in the slot as that full-time slot player, I think that he could easily soak up targets underneath from Carson Wentz, and that's going to be something that could lead to him returning value here on the 109. If he plays outside consistently all the time, I just don't know if he's going to see enough volume week in and week out to be this truly consistent player, but have no issue with him here at the 109. He's my number 10 overall player on my big board. Have no issue with that. I'm going to go here with another wide receiver. I'm going to go George Pickens, the wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And as we look at Pickens, I think there's two ways to look at his projection. One is, are we looking at Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool being around for 2023? And if we lose one of those players, if Deontay Johnson leaves and walks in free agency, then we could look at Pickens as an absolute stud moving forward because the talent level was absolutely there. It's evident on tape, but it's just a matter of what is the target available target share for him moving forward? Because in 2022, you have a very loaded offense. You have Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, George Pickens, Calvin Austin, who they added in the fourth round. I really like you got Najee Harris out of the backfield, Pat Fryermuth, right? And then you got questions with the quarterback. Is it Mitchell Trubisky? Is it Kenny Pickett? Just what's the target share? What's the upside for Pickens this year? But moving forward, if we do get a little bit of clarity on this receiving core moving into 2023, the sky's the limit for Pickens. So at this point where you're in the back end of the first round, this is where you can start to think about what's the potential for next year, right? Okay, do I get a safe floor this year? But then moving forward, do I have the potential to continue building on for a team that's most likely competing deep into the playoffs if you're drafting in the back end of the first round to reload and help you continue to compete deep into the playoffs moving forward. So George Pickens, the wide receiver out of Pittsburgh uh, at the 110. You are now up at the 111, my friend. Yeah, I just got to say, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting that, like, I think the Pickens pick sort of signals that Mike Tomlin has had it with the immaturity of Chase Claypool, but yet he's picking a guy who's possibly got immaturity right, issues. Right. As the guy. So that's, I, I can't wait to see how that plays out. I mean, I wish mm-hmm. the Steelers were like the hard knocks team because I'd love to see right. what that looks like in training camp. But um, so 111, I'm going to be a homer uh, for my Green Bay Packers and take Christian Watson. And obviously, he steps into a great situation as far as target availability following the departure of Devonta Adams. I think, and the other guy they're trying to replace is Marquez Valdez Scantling, and that's who I think uh, the floor is here. Mm-hmm. The floor is MVS, a tall, fast receiver who had some drop issues in college, but the ceiling is significantly higher than that for Watson. We know that he didn't get a lot of college competition high level college competition at North Dakota State but uh you know he was voted at the senior bowl like the the best receiver of the week by the cornerbacks at the senior bowl so like he just killed it in the off season with the combine and the senior bowl like he no one improved their stock more than Christian Watson so um I like him here I I think there's upside and you know there's a chance to be an immediate contributor in Green Bay I think it's a swing for the fences pick and it could easily hit. You're looking at that wide receiver depth chart in Green Bay and you're saying there's a very realistic chance that Christian Watson in year one 
climbs to the top of it and becomes a trusted receiver for Aaron Rodgers. And who wouldn't want to have the wide receiver one for Aaron Rodgers on your roster? But yet at the same time, Christian Watson is a bit of a developmental player. He There is some projection to his game. So not a guarantee, but has the upside. Absolutely. My question for you is, as we look at the early return on ADP here, which stands for average draft position, uh, we're seeing Christian Watson actually go off the board in the range of Chris Olave, Sky Moore, ahead of Jahan Dotson, George Pickens. What's the earliest that you would be willing to pull the trigger on Christian Watson? Is it here at the 111? Or are we, you know, are you comfortable taking that shot as we get up into the 108, 109 territory? It's 110. Um, I would have taken all the other guys who have gone before him except Pickens, and he's just a little ahead of Pickens for me. I mean, that's like, I have no sure. issue with Pickens over Watson at all. But yep. for me, it would be Watson over Pickens. They're back to back in my overall big board at 11 and 12. We've got Pickens at 11, Christian Watson at 12. So right in that range. All right, here at the 112 to wrap up the first round, I'm going to go Damian Pierce, the running back for the Houston Texans. And this is in really, really interesting. Again, I mentioned the ADP and we've got return on that. Damian Pierce is not going anywhere near the back end of the first round. And I think that that is a mistake. As we look at the ability for in this running back class, who out of these guys has the ability to see 200 to 250 carries in his rookie season? It's Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, if, you know, Rashad Penny, something happens to him, if they just run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And then it's Damian Pierce. Like, you can't look at any of these other guys and say, yes, they're going to potentially see 250 carries in year one. Rashad White, no. James Cook, no. Like, as you look at these other running backs, for a team that is under, going to be committed to running the football underneath Lovey Smith, Damian Pierce is already the most talented running back on that depth chart, which is not a very high bar to clear. But the ability for him to see a massive workload in year one is 100% there. He was underutilized at Florida. The talent is absolutely evident when you put on the tape. Uh, I think that he is going to make an immediate impact at the next level. And if in a running back class where we don't have that guarantee for a lot of these guys, I'm going with Damian Pierce here in the back end of the first round. And he is an absolute steal, in my opinion, in Dynasty Rookie Drafts currently. Any quick thoughts there on Damian Pierce? Yeah, I think he could have gone, uh, could have been going much higher in rookie drafts if Dan Mullen knew what he was doing. If Dan right. Mullen was a decent head coach and actually used this uh, extraordinary talent. So, yeah, I mean, he does pop on film for sure. And I can't really argue with you going for the high upside guy, the guy who could be a three down back. All so, right. You are now up at the 201. Let's get into the second round here. Yeah. So we'll go with uh, James Cook and like, you know, the speed, but you sort of nailed it with the Pierce pick. We know that Cook is probably not going to be a three down back at any point in his NFL career, but you know, his, his game does play for the PPR format. Um, as potentially the prime passing down back in a prolific offense. So that could be a handy roll. There's some big play ex uh, explosion here. Um, you know, just a playmaker, a playmaker, and he's going to walk right into a roll on a very good team. So, um, yeah, Cook, Cook opens the second round. We look at that projection for Cook, and we know the role. Like, it's very easy to say, here's the role. But as we look at that role on a different offense versus Buffalo, I want to talk about this really quick. But as we look at, you know, the prolific offense with a Tom Brady led offense, right? Tom Brady as the quarterback or in years past a Ben Roethlisberger or the Phillip Rivers, right? Like these older, more or less mobile quarterbacks. I think that James Cook, I would be absolutely on board with drafting him in the top 10 picks because he's going to soak up targets. But as we look at that fit with Josh Allen, he's going to occupy a very specific role and a very valuable role for an NFL offense. But yet at the same time, what's kind of the expectation in your opinion of how many targets is he going to see? Because it's not like he's going to be James White in New England with Mac Jones, where White was feasting last year. I just don't see that happening when we have Josh Allen, who's able to send the ball 40 yards deep downfield and is rarely looking to check it down. Right. That is a fair point. We are not going to, you know, when uh, Josh Allen gets into trouble, he runs. He doesn't check it down. Tom Brady gets into trouble. He checks it down. He doesn't run. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we're not going to see a 70 catch season out of out of Cook in year one, I don't think. So that's a, a fair point. And, uh, you know, maybe he does need to get some of that uh, rushing load and cut into Devin Singletary's share right. a little bit to be as valuable as people are hoping he's going to be. I mean, I've seen him going like late first round in right. some rookie draft exactly. states. So. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of just the thing that I wanted to push back on was just, you know, like what, 
we really need to keep that in mind because it's not like he's going to soak up, soak up, soak up targets. He's going to fill that very valuable role. And a lot of people overreacted to the draft capital. He got drafted in the back end of the second round. But I just don't know what that, you know, what the opportunity is truly when we sit down and do projections, when we yeah. look at how it plays out in the, again, fills a very valuable role for the Bills offense. I just don't know how valuable that is for fantasy football here in the beginning of the second round into the second round a little bit. Absolutely comfortable taking the shot on him. All right. I'm going to go here at the 202. I'm going to go with Rashad White, the running back out of Arizona State lands with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I think that what he is going to do is instantly fill that vacated Giovanni Bernard role. Now, that wasn't a very valuable role for fantasy football, just with Leonard Fournette stepping in and taking over that true three down workload. But with White, he has that role because he's a very capable and reliable pass catcher. So he's going to fill that role for this offense, take some of the workload off of Leonard Fournette, keep him fresh as they're looking to make a deep playoff push. But he holds immense upside if something were to happen to Leonard Fournette. And that's something that we need to bank on and talk about in our dynasty leagues where we take the guys who have the high upside. So if white can get that workload where something happens to Fournette, he can get the workload. He can be the guy who, you know, uh, has a three down workload for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. That's a very, very valuable fantasy asset. So here at the beginning of the second round, I'll go Rashad white. You're now up at the two Oh three. Yeah. And uh, here's where things start to get really interesting right. and boards start to diverge. Um, and so it's not a comfortable pick here, but I'm going to go with Alec Pierce who uh, sort of gave me Jordy Nelson vibes at hmm. Cincinnati. And, um, you know, in interesting landing spots, uh, Michael Pittman is the alpha in Indy, but I think there's some available targets there as, uh, you know, no one has really stepped up to be that number two guy. And, you know, we've got a, a quarterback upgrade for the Colts with Matt Ryan. So, um yeah, I, I'm kind of interested to see what Pierce can do. We like the size, we like the speed, and mm -hmm. um, you know, boy, if we if we get that Jordy Nelson ceiling, it's going to be pretty nice to get him in the second round. The opportunity is there. He's walking right into a starting role in that offense, so yeah. absolutely worth taking the shot on here in the beginning of the second round. Here at the 204, I'm going to go back to the running back position. He was my RB3 in the pre-draft process. Fell to the fourth round, but I do like the landing spot here with the Los Angeles Chargers. The Chargers have been trying to fill this vacated Melvin Gordon role for a couple of years now, right? And we saw Austin Eckler truly turn into a workhorse back this last year. I just don't know for the longevity of Eckler's career if that can hold up, right? He was second in the NFL last year in red zone rush attempts i just don't know if that's how you want to continue utilizing austin eckler so with isaiah stepping in isaiah spiller stepping in he can be the guy who is the goal line option the red zone option and then holds upside if eckler goes down with an injury and that's kind of what you're looking for here with this running back class when you don't have the guys who have guaranteed workloads guaranteed roles you're looking for the upside if the starter above them goes down with injury here are the 204 very comfortable still taking isaiah spiller off the board uh, the Los Angeles Chargers running back. All right, you are now up at the 205. All right, I'm going to stick with uh, wide receiver. And this is a guy I really liked in college and wasn't sure uh, how he was going to be treated as far as draft capital. I mean, there was a chance this guy could be a sixth or seventh round pick, but no, he went late on day two, David Bell, to a really good situation in Cleveland, which might have a vacancy for a slot receiver with uh, – yep. Uh, Jarvis Landry still unsigned, and obviously the quarterback quarterback upgrade coming in with Deshaun Watson. So, um, you know, Bell, a guy who broke out at age 18 at Purdue, and over his three years at Purdue averaged eight catches and better than 100 receiving yards a game. I mean, the guy's just a baller. I know he didn't really uh, improve his draft stock with a sluggish 40 time at the combine, but the guy gets open. Like, he's got a little bit of an Anquan Bolden, Bolden mm -hmm. in him. I'm not sure if he's got the, you know, Hall of Fame level competitiveness that Bolden has, but... Bell is tough to bring down after the catch. Like, he is an effort guy. So um, I, I love that he went on day two of the draft, and uh, I yep. think he's going to do well in Cleveland. The Cleveland Browns lose Jarvis Landry in free agency, and they get a guy who can fill a very similar role and skill set, right? It's an easy, I keep saying, an easy projection at the next level for David Bell to just step right into that role. And we saw Landry, who's not a, you know, all-class athlete, world athlete or anything like that. He succeeded in the NFL and in that role for the Cleveland Browns offense. It, there is still some risk because you just don't know how that la lack of athleticism is going to translate, but you're into the beginning, or, you know, the middle of the second round. This is where you can start to take some shots here, and if it doesn't pan out, it's not going to crush your roster. I'm going to go with Zamir White here at the 206, uh, the running back for the Las Vegas Raiders. I love Zamir White coming into the NFL draft. Uh, now he falls in a situation where I just don't think he's going to see a ton of workload here or a ton of work here in year one. 
I mean, his rookie season, I think he's going to sit. He might come in as re a relief, you know, kind of pitcher for uh, – for Josh Jacobs, but really interesting the timing where we had Josh Jacobs and his fifth year option decline. And then later on that day or the next day, you know, the Las Vegas Raiders select Samir White. And I think as we look at Josh McDaniels and the coaching philosophy, he wants to have that rotation, right? Those guys that can step in in different roles. Samir White next year, if they let Josh Jacobs walk in free agency, is going to be the first and second down guy. And you've got those pass catchers behind him to fill that third down role. Zamir White, not a pass catcher. So he projects perfectly into that first and second down role for an offense that should be a lot, like should be really good here in 2022 and beyond. I like the fit for Zamir White. You're going to have to wait on him, but I do think that he can pay off down the road. 206 Zamir White. You're now up at the 207. All right, I'm going to go with Jalen Tolbert uh, from the Cowboys. Pretty good landing spot. Uh, a target vacancy with Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson gone. And uh, just a guy who, like, you watch him on tape. And it's it's an impressive uh, overall. He leaves a good impression when you watch the film. Not the biggest dude in the world, but, like, I think he's going to play a pretty significant role right away for the Cowboys. And, uh, you know, I do think there's some... Some upside, even if uh, I am expecting C.D. Lamb to become an alpha receiver, like Tolbert can be a good number two. Yeah, and you look at that immediate return on value, right? With Michael Gallup rehabbing from the injury, Tol Tolbert yeah. could be on the field right away uh, this next season. So it could be someone that even if you don't have the long-term hope for Tolbert, like you can draft him here in the back end of the second round and then flip him for something more than that if he does hit at the beginning of the season. All right, I'm going to go Kenny Pickett here. Let's get the first quarterback off the board at the 208. Again, a one quarterback format. Uh, so Kenny Pickett, I I don't know if he's going to play a ton this season. you got Mitchell Trubisky there as that bridge gap quarterback. You know, Pickett was the most pro-ready quarterback to, you know, and ready to step in. And we saw that with the 20th overall selection and then the massive gap before the next quarterback went off the board. So I think he's ready to start this year, but with Trubisky in on that contract, I just don't know if they're going to rush Pickett. So you might have to wait a little bit here, but we talked about it with Pickens, the receiving core that he has around him. That's impressive. And Pickett just has to stay out of his own way, deliver the ball accurately. We know that's what he can do from his tape. So Pickett here at the 208, that's a good spot to take him in a one quarterback league. Let's go to the 209. You're now on the clock. Um, I'm going to go with Trey McBride here, break the seal on tight ends. Uh, no, he's not Kyle Pitts. No, he's not going to be as coveted as uh, who's the Georgia kid. Yeah, it's Brock Bowers. Will be in a couple of years. Um, but he is pretty far and away, I think, the best pass-catching tight end in this class. Don't really feel great about the landing spot, though. He's going to immediately yep. be behind Zach Ertz on a team that has not historically used its tight ends a lot and uh right. you know got the kingsbury offense do you really have a use for two tight ends so uh might have to put him on ice for at least a year but i do think he is uh gonna eventually pay off because he is a a quality pass catcher like a, a really good pass catching tight end mm -hmm. uh just don't love the immediate fit but i think 209 is a decent spot for him the talent's there. The landing spot sucks. I yes. don't understand the landing spot whatsoever. <laughs> oh, if he had man. ended up somewhere else, we would be talking about him going much higher than this in your dynasty rookie draft. All right, here at the 210, I'm going to go with John Mechie, the wide receiver for the Houston Texans. Now, I did not come away incredibly impressed with Mechie's tape after watching it. I just viewed him as a very solid and reliable receiver. And you know what? That's what Houston needs. You've got Brandon Cooks there too, you know, and we know the talent level of Cooks. Uh, you've got Nico Collins, who we still kind of have to see what's going to happen here. But Mechie can be that underneath reliable receiver for Davis Mills. I don't think that he has, you know, top 24 upside ever in his NFL career. But as a low end wide receiver three, a flex play week in and week out that just brings you a safe and steady floor. I think that's what Mechie is going to bring when he recovers from his injury. So here at the 210, I'm fine pulling the trigger on him there. Let's go to the 211. You are now on the clock. All right, Yates, I got to bring at least one hot take to your show. And here's the hot take, okay? In a two quarterback or super flex draft, I'm absolutely taking Pickett as the top quarterback. In a one QB, I would actually take Malik Willis ahead of Kenny right. Pickett because I think Pickett offers limited upside, no Konami code. Um, you know, a guy who didn't really break out until late in his career when he was playing against basically much younger guys. So I kind of worry that he's going to be sort of in the Case Keenum zone where he's either like a low-level starter or a sure. high-level backup. Um, whereas Malik Willis, this could completely not work out. It could right. turn out to be, I mean, the NFL has already given him the thumbs-down verdict at the draft and letting him slide to the third round, which was you know still the most uh, shocking Nuts. thing of the entire draft. But if he does pay off, 
Like if, if he hits, if he can get a, um, you know, I've heard he's not like a great whiteboard guy, but if he can get uh, with the right quarterback coach, the right offensive coordinator, just sit for a year behind Ryan Tannehill in Tennessee. Like we know what the tools are like. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's major potential here. And if he does get on the field, I mean, like he could be basically the discount Trey Lance. Yep. A lot of running and, and we'll see with the passing. But, um, you know, there's like Jalen Hurts, Trey Lance potential here. Yep, absolutely. All right, here at the 212, I'm going to go Tyler Algier, the running back for the Atlanta Falcons. Now, I did not come away loving Algier's tape. Thought he was just a, you know, steady and reliable running back uh, that could get an opportunity and could be fantasy relevant if he ended up in the right spot. You know what? He ended up in a right spot for fantasy football. As we look at that Atlanta Falcons backfield, you got Mike Davis being released here. It's Cordero Patterson, but I think they're going to need to line him up at wide receiver a lot more this next year. uh, As you look at that wide receiver depth chart. So I think Algier has an easy path for opportunity. And that's what we want here with this running back class. As we look at some of these guys, I just need, especially in this range back into the second round, I just need you to get an opportunity. I need you to have the chance to climb a depth chart and Algier here in the back end of the second round. Is he, once he gets the opportunity, is he going to be a top 12 running back? No, I don't think so. I think he's going to be one of these guys that's kind of a plotter, can really, you know, average around that like 3.8 yards per attempt, might score here or there. Uh, I don't have really high hopes. But again, we're at this range in your draft where you're just looking for the opportunity as we move into the back end of the second round, early third. Algier has that. So I think it's a fine, t- uh, you know, time to take a shot on him. All right, you're up at the 301. Let's kick off the third round. Man, I'm letting you get all the running backs, Yates, and uh, I'm going to continue to hammer the wide receivers and go with the guy who I've been a big fan of, Khalil Shakir. Um, Just the ultra competitiveness of this guy, like getting the captaincy as a a junior at Boise State, and like this guy leaves it all on the field, and now he goes to Buffalo, where there might be a slot vacancy. I know they signed Jamison Crowder after letting Cole Beasley walk, but like we know Jamison Crowder gets hurt a lot. We know Jamison Crowder's kind of just limited you know mm-hmm. he's he's a, a an okay run-of-the-mill undersized slot receiver I think Shakir can be a whole lot more and he goes to this prolific passing offense so I like the fit all right here at the 302 I had to scroll way far down the ADP to get this guy uh but I'm stand I'm sticking true to my overall big board and I want to just kind of balance this out and saying where I'm going to take Kate Otten the tight end for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers here at the 302 Based on ADP, you most likely do not have to take Kate Otten here at this spot. But I want to kind of put my name by and signal to you guys, pay attention to Kate Otten when you are on the clock in the third round of your dynasty rookie drafts. The I He was my tight end too going into the NFL draft. I love the talent. think that he can fill a very, very solid and reliable underneath receiver role. He has the size. He can be a solid blocker. He can get on the field. You look at Tampa Bay. Cameron Brate is the only guy standing in his way currently to catch passes from Tom Brady this next season. Now, Gronk might come back, might not. Even if he does, even if Gronk does come back, he's not exactly a guarantee to stay healthy. So Otten could see the field here immediately in his rookie season. I I mean, again, like he's going outside the top 40, top 45 in ADP from MFL. That's absolutely ridiculous here. I'll go Kate Otten here at the 302. But again, I think you can wait on him just a little bit longer. Wanted to point out that Kate Otten is an incredible value. All right, you're on the clock at the 303. Yeah, so I'm going to go with a player I love, even though he wound up in a landing spot I hate, and that's uh, Brian Robinson. And imagine, Yates, if Brian Robinson were in place of Damian Pierce with the Texans, because you've got this big downhill runner who can catch passes and has SEC pedigree, um, potential for being a three-down back. And he goes to Washington, where you've got... Antonio Gibson entrenched as the early down guy and J.D. McKissick as the passing down guy. So he is just going to be like a double backup. Um, But eventually, you know, people get hurt. Things happen. Mm -hmm. Um, Bet on the talent here. McKissick's not going to be around forever. I think he just signed a one-year deal. So uh, at some point, oh, it was two years. Oh, man. Robinson's (laughs) going to get in the field at some point. Uh, I, I like the player, but admittedly, the landing spot's terrible. Yep, it is. And I think that, uh, again, in this range with the running backs, you're looking for the upside, the potential. And if Robinson does get an opportunity, if Gibson goes down with an injury, he can produce. And that's what you're looking for here in the beginning of the third round. I'm going to go again at the running back position. I'm going to go Kyron Williams. Loved Williams going into the NFL combine that did not 
play out well for me afterwards with the athletic testing there, but still looking at him being able to fill a very, very valuable and productive role as a pass catcher out of the backfield and a pass protector. I think he's going to get onto the field right away uh, alongside Cam Akers. I think that Daryl Henderson is now just kind of moving into that like change of pace, but I think it's going to be Cam Akers and I think it's going to be Kyron Williams in this backfield moving forward. And that means that Williams here, especially in full PPR formats, is an incredible value. I'm fine taking the shot on him here to get this role in this offense here at the 304. You're up at the 305. Okay. Um, you know, this might be spitting into the wind here, Yates, because the only sub five foot nine wide receivers to go for 900 plus yards in the Super Bowl era Richard Johnson with the Lions in 1989, Cole Beasley with the Bills in 2020. So uh, I'm going to take Wandale Robinson with the Giants. Um, hope that they trade Kadarius Toney as right. they've apparently been trying to do. Hope that, you know, he finds a nice fit as a regular in the uh, often used three and four wide receiver sets of Brian Dable. And, you know, hope that Dable, whose offensive wizardry I've, I put a lot of faith in, can find ways to get this guy into space and let him make plays because his speed is electric. I was going to be taking Wandale Robinson here at the 306 if you did not take him. He was my the next highest rated player on my big board. It was such a puzzling draft pick right like it was such a puzzling selection for the new york giants with a top 50 pick you go with wandale robinson you go where does he play where unless you are trading Kadarius tony this move does not make much sense so we really it's a complete shot in the dark it's a complete dart throw here with robinson but the talent level is there i like his tape i like the athleticism i think that he can come away and be a productive after the catch type player in this offense just a matter of can he get onto the field like what's the plan for him there's a little bit of uncertainty there but i think this is the the shot where you are the chance where you uh you take the shot on him all right here at the 306 i am going to go here with hassan haskins another running back here the backup for the tennessee titans i love the landing spot with haskins running behind uh derrick henry there that is just pure power uh just time and time again and we saw you know with henry going down last year deontay foreman was a valuable fantasy asset for a while i like the talent level of haskins more than foreman so if you can get the chance, I think Haskins can be very productive for fantasy. I'll go off the board here at the 306. You're now up at the 307. All right. I don't love uh, the quarterback, but there's Konami code potential, obviously, with Desmond Ritter. So that's the way I'm going to go here. And, uh, you know, he's got a pretty clear runway in Atlanta with only um, uh, Mariota in front of him. So going to go with Ritter here and just hope he can get me some of that Konami code rushing goodness at some point. All right, sticking true to my big board here, I'm going to go Keonta Ingram, the running back for the Arizona Cardinals. Sixth round selection, not a guarantee that he really finds a role here in this offense. I like Eno Benjamin as a winner. Talked about that on a previous podcast episode. Eno Benjamin, a winner after the NFL draft. James Conner, a winner after the NFL draft. Who knows what this backfield is going to uh, you know, entail down the road. But Ingram here, you know, there's the potential. I liked his tape. I think that he's limited. I don't think that he's going to immediately make a splash in the NFL, but has the potential to carve out a role in this offense. I think that it's a long shot, but again, we're in the range of long shots here. So Keonta Ingram off the board at the 308. You're now up at the 309. All right, I'll continue the quarterback run, I guess, or at least my personal run with Matt Corral <laughs> here. Uh, you know, pretty easy path. He's got Sam Darnold in front of right. him, which right. some people would consider to be more of a stepping stone uh, than anything else. So um, I'm not sure I believe in Matt Corral. I mean, Yates, doesn't this draft year just like have you starved for the 2023 quarterback Seriously. class? I mean, man, next year it's going to be a totally different ball game with quarterbacks. Um, but, you know, Corral does have a, a fairly easy path to becoming an NFL starter. Not sure I love the player, but you know, he's, he does have some tools. There's going to be an opportunity. Yep. You're looking for opportunity in this range of the draft. All right. I'll go with Greg Dulcich here. The tight end out of UCLA lands with the Denver Broncos could potentially fill the vacated Noah Fant role uh, down the road. I think Albert O is going to get the first shot here to be the tight end one in this offense. But if Dulcich can carve out that role and be the tight end one for this offense in a Russell Wilson led offense, an offense that could be top five in the score in scoring next year, there's potential there down the road. So I'll go Dulcich here off the board at the 310. You're up at the 311. Oh, I'm going to once again be a homer and go with Romeo Dubs. Um, interesting that he led all of FBS last year, and I think uh, yardage and touchdowns on post patterns. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe he is the MVS replacement in this right. offense. And, uh, you know, the draft capital that the Packers invested in him is, uh, you know, significant enough to think that he is going to have a role on this team. 
you know, that has so much need for guys to fill the fill vacancies at wide receiver. So Romeo Dubs is the pick. All right, I'll go Velas Jones here at the 312, the wide receiver for the Chicago Bears. Uh, again, opportunity. Like, look at that depth chart in Chicago. And it's like, how are you not going to give Jones a significant opportunity this next year, right? It's Darnell Mooney, it's Cole Komet, maybe. And then you got a bunch of unknowns at the wide receiver position. So the opportunity for Jones to climb that depth chart is absolutely there. Here at the 312, that's accounting for his age. It's accounting for the lack of production at Tennessee, right? I didn't think that his tape was all, you know, was absolutely outstanding. So it's taken into account there. Right? You're taking some some risk here, but at the 312, there's the potential. So I'll go Vilas Jones Jr., the wide receiver for the Chicago Bears, off the board at the 312. You're up to begin the fourth round. Um, Jerome Ford, running back Cleveland Browns. Decent size. I like the tape. Uh, it's going to be a red shirt year for him with the Browns. Yep. No question about that, barring you know some major injury issues. But uh, I believe Kareem Hunt is entering the last year of his contract. So uh, and Hunt as a backup has been pretty valuable, like a a um, more valuable than some starters. So yep. uh, potential that come 2023 that we see Ford play a pretty significant role in what should be a really good offense with a good offensive line, good quarterback. Right. A lot of opportunity, maybe. He has the pass-catching chops, the pass-protection chops there to be that Kareem Hunt guide alongside Nick Chubb. And in an offense next year that could be extremely, extremely potent, then we're looking at Jerome Ford potentially being a steal when we look back at this next year. I'll go Calvin Austin in the third, the wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Did not get as high draft capital as I thought he was going to, but still love the talent, love the player. Uh, we might have to wait a year. You know, We're in that, that territory of redshirt years and stuff like that, but... With Austin, he could fill a slot role for the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2023 and beyond, like the talent there. I'll go Austin at the 402. You're up now at the 403. All right. At this point, Yates, I'm just blindly following draft capital with Tyquan Thornton. <laughs> uh, and no one liked this pick. I mean, for him to be going ahead of Sky Moore, I mean, are you kidding me? Ahead of George Pickens, right. just crazy. Uh, Baylor receivers have a terrible history. New England Patriots receivers, for the most part, <laughs> drafted early, have a terrible history. Yep. Um, it, it just, like, this one seems to spell doom, but, I mean, they did make an early investment in him. Yep. He is really fast, so uh, cross your fingers and hope it's a fourth-round pick at this point. So that's all you can do, man. Yep, we'll stick with the speed receiver uh, here at the 404. I'm going to go Danny Gray. He landed with the San Francisco 49ers, third round draft capital. Uh, we've seen, you know, this type of role in this 49ers offense previously with Marquise Goodwin, right? That ability to just stretch the field. And it's kind of hit here or there. But as we look at Trey Lance and his absolute cannon of an arm, going to be the starter this next year, most likely in San Francisco, his ability to connect deep downfield with Gray, with Gray who can get downfield in a hurry, the wide receiver at SMU. I think that it's a fine shot to take here at the 404. So Danny Gray, the wide receiver for the 49ers at the 404. You're on the clock at the 405. All right, I'm going to take Tyler Beatty, and this guy's been kind of a favorite of mine. I have some friends who went to Mizzou, so they turned me on to this guy. I mean, he was basically the only thing the Missouri offense had this past year. SEC defenses knew what Missouri was throwing at them, and this dude was still able to, like, rack up a lot of rushing and receiving yardage yep. i mean for a little guy for a 5-8 guy this guy was like handling a walter payton type workload for uh mizzou like you know 30 touches a game this guy would get it was so, absurd yeah i mean obviously he's a, a guy that small is not going to handle that sort of load in the nfl he's he's you know not another uh ray rice level talent but, man, he does go to a really nice situation, potentially, with the Baltimore Ravens, who like to run the ball and, uh, you know, have had some running backs with injury issues. So, yep. um, potentially a very interesting spot for a guy who was super productive in the SEC. I'll go with Tyrion Davis-Price, the running back uh, for the 49ers here at the 406. And this was a draft pick that made absolutely no sense to me. Don't really understand it. It's a backfield that I really don't personally want to invest in. But when the price is right, I think that that was not a pun intended pun with Davis Price. Uh, when the draft cost is right here, right, as we, the value is correct, we're looking at price going at the 406, right? Like, what happens with if Kyle Shanahan is just like, okay, TDP, you're the guy this week. You know, like, at least you have this guy hanging on the back of your roster where he could be a starter for you at some point, or he could be the Trey Sermon and doesn't really pan out. That's why he's going here in the fourth round. TDP off the board at the 406. You're now up at the 407. 
All right, I'll take Jeremy Ruckert at the 407. Yeah, it's just a guy I really like. I mean, he was yep. uh, either the number two or the number three tight end for me pre-draft, uh, right behind, I think he was right behind uh, Dulcich. So, yeah, I mean, like, the stats aren't going to wow you from his Ohio State days, but look at what they had at wide receiver. So, uh, mm-hmm. And he did show up in some of their biggest games. Like, he'd make big catches in the, uh, you know, college football playoffs. So, um Really like him and think he will have an opportunity with the Jets. Yep, same here. I like him too. I'll go with another backfield that I would personally love to avoid, but at the 408, it's fine. Uh, I'll go Pierre Strong Jr., the running back for the New England Patriots. Who knows what the plan is in this backfield long term? Who knows if they are going to turn the reins over to Strong in 2023 when Damian Harris is gone or if it's going to be Ramondre Stevenson or if next year Bill Belichick will draft two running backs again in the NFL draft. Who absolutely freaking knows? But it's a shot worth taking. I'll go Pierre Strong here at the 408. You got two picks left in this mock draft. You're up at the 409. All right. Speaking of shots worth taking, Yates, uh, we're going to go with Isaiah Pacheco. I'm yep. not a uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire believer. And, um, you know, if Pacheco can get a foot in the door in this Kansas City backfield, um, you know, we know there's, there's a lot to like if you get a. Uh, a piece of the KC backfield. There's a lot of touchdown potential and Pacheco is like a good player, man. He always popped uh, in Rutgers games. There wasn't a lot going on. He was playing in a lousy offense. Um, you know, I know Matt Waldman is a big fan of Pacheco too. He mentioned him pre-draft on a, a podcast I did with Matt. Um, so I'm going to take that flyer and, and hope that he connects in a high scoring offense. I will go here with the 410, my second to last selection here. I'm going to go with Devontae Price, the running back that landed as a UDFA for the Indianapolis Colts. And you look at that backfield in Indianapolis, it's Jonathan Taylor, it's Naheem Hines, and then there's a role for the backup opportunity there along, or, you know, behind Jonathan Taylor. So, again, God forbid something happens to Jonathan Taylor. You've got Price, who I liked his tape. I thought he was a solid backup at the next level. Didn't see him going undrafted, but he goes undrafted, lands with the Indianapolis Colts. There's an opportunity. There's a path there for opportunity. So I'll go with Devontae Price at the 410. You're up here with your last selection at the 411. All right, Yates, let's stick with the uh, UDFAs and go with Justin Ross. And, uh, you know, speaking of another uh, another opportunity with the guy landing on the Chiefs. And, I mean, this guy was producing right up there with T. Higgins. Uh, you know, playing with T. Higgins, Hunter Renfro, and, like, still catching a significant target share and uh yeah yeah, so this guy can play obviously there's some major medical concerns the fact that this guy goes undrafted um maybe there are worries about the the liability with him i don't know man i mean he's a long shot at this point but obviously it's a long shot that could pay off if he proves that he is healthy enough and can find a way into the kansas city wide receiver room was really shocked that he lasted as long on the UDFA market as he did. You know, even shocked that he went undrafted, but then also stayed on the UDFA market for a long time. So Justin Ross, though, landing in Kansas City, it's a chance worth taking. I'll go here with my last pick. I'll go with the Green Bay Packers wide receiver just for you, Pat. I will go Samore Toure, the seventh round selection here. Uh, Produced in a big way at the FCS level, then transferred to Nebraska, a run first offense, and put up nearly 900 yards this past season. So I like the talent level. I went, I had not watched him going into the NFL draft. I came back back, watched his tape and came away impressed. I think there's an opportunity for him to climb that depth chart long term. So you might have to wait a little bit. This might be a selection at the back end of the fourth round that, you know, you're waiting on for it to turn into something. But I do think that he has the potential to turn into something long term. And that's what I'm looking for here at the back end of the fourth round. All right, Pat, that will do it for the overall mock draft. Thank you again for carving out some time coming on. Always fun to talk prospects with you and always good to just catch up and do a podcast with you, man. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure, Yay. It's great to talk to you again, and uh, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Absolutely. Before we let you get out of here, why don't you let people know what you got going on over at Fantasy Pros, where they can find and follow you and more your work. Sure. Uh, people can find me on Twitter at Fitz underscore FF, uh, and they can find my work at Fantasy Pros, um, including... My two podcasts, uh, trying to fill your shoes, Yates, on the Fantasy <laughs> Pros Dynasty podcast, along with Scott Bogman. It takes two guys to fill the <laughs> shoes of Kyle Yates. And, uh, you know, then my podcast, Fits on Fantasy, has now migrated over to Fantasy Pros, and people awesome. can find that one there, too. So thanks again, buddy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Always good to chat. All right. Reminder to rate and review the show. If you've got 30 seconds out of your day, head over there. If you enjoy the content here, it's a great way to help out and support the show. Easy to do 30 seconds out of your day, rating and reviewing the podcast on Apple podcasts or Spotify. Great, great help and great way to support the show. 
All right, that'll do it for Pat Fitzmorris. I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.